Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares webcast series supporting family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified Alzheimer care consultant, and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee the program, who include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Freed, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of donors. Today's topic is understanding early onset dementia. And my guest is Dr. Pedro Rosanetto, Professor of Neurology at McGill University and the Director of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. He was recently named adjunct professor at the Department of Biomedical Science and Engineering at the Wang Yu Institute of Science and Technology. He is a clinical neurologist with expertise in the quantification of dementia, pathophysiology, and preclinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease using biomarkers. I'm very proud to say that Dr. Rosanetto has recently joined the executive committee of the Dementia Education Program and is also my teammate on the World Alzheimer Report for the 2021 and 22 reports. So very happy to have you here today. Welcome, Pedro. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. For me, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this morning discussing about this very topic, important topic. And uh, I'm uh, very excited actually to, to, to interact with you uh, guys over here. So thank you. So today we're going to be really understanding uh, early onset dementia that affects younger people. So can you please um, talk to us about what is early onset dementia and like at what age does it normally appear? Before uh, talking about uh, early onset or young onset dementia, I'd like to talk a little bit about cognition and behavior. So the brain uh, possesses several functions necessary for the execution of activities of daily living. For example, attention, language, ability to see and to understand the visual world, ability to execute movements and to do tasks, memory and orientation. So this comes uh, from a very extensive networks of neurons that exist in the brain. This is the final result of our interaction between 10 billion neurons working very actively, firing 50 times per second. And these neurons, they are connected using a vast uh, pathways in the brain that uh, connect all these neurons forming about 100 trillion synapses. So in order to do this work, there is a very high demand of energy. So blood is provided by the uh, to the brain, about 15% of the what the heart can pups uh, end up in the brain. The brain consumes about 20% of oxygen in the blood and 25% of glucose in the blood. So it's an organ that consumes a lot of energy in order to work properly. And as you can imagine, there is some waste of metabolism, and this waste of metabolism has to be efficient, clear because uh, when, when you have a very nice and important energy production rates, so uh, it's important to make sure that the system is clean and working perfectly. So what happens in dementia? There are two important processes that are critical to, develop, uh, to impose a limitation on the efficiency of the system. The first one is the supply of energy. So anything that can disrupt the blood supply and the nutrient supply for the brain can cause a failure of the system. Another important pathophysiological mechanism, I mean, the origin of the problem is a, 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 a alteration on the native disposition of the proteins. Imagine here that you have a, a, a raw egg and the raw egg has proteins that are uh, shaped in order to interact one to the other, and together they will be able to produce a biologically active and relevant uh, bean. And uh, uh, 
uh, when these proteins are misfolded and aggregated, like in the egg uh, that is cooked, so this process is not more available. Although the proteins are, they are exactly the same, they are not already built or they are not in shape in order to produce something biological viable. So diseases like Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia and other kinds of neurodegenerative conditions, they are characterized by exactly, exactly this pro process. These proteins in the native space are, are native uh, state. They are misfolded and aggregated and they just don't work anymore. Therefore, the definition of early onset dementia is when dementia starts before 65 years old. So this contrast with dementia that start after 65 years old, which we call senile dementia, and before 65 years old, we call pre-senile dementia. There is not necessarily a biological reason for that. The reason is just uh, imposed by tradition. And this comes back from the beginning of the 20th century. So what would be some of the signs and symptoms of early onset dementia? So that's a very important question. So it's not only the age that differentiate early onset and late onset dementia, but also the types of symptoms. Usually when the dementia starts after 65 years old and is characterized by memory impairments, we call it typical dementia. Early onset dementia usually presents as an atypical syndrome. It's when the patient have difficulties related to the visual spatial system. It means that the patient has difficulty to interpret the visual world. So there is individuals that they come frequently to the, to the, to the consultation telling that they have been in ophthalmologists and they cannot have a diagnosis. They have problems of driving. They have problems sometimes to write and read. And they, we call it visual spatial Alzheimer's uh, disease or visual spatial dementia. These individuals, uh, they, uh, their memory is not that bad. They have a predominance of symptoms on the visual spatial area. There is another form that's characterized by language alterations. So the patients, they had uh, difficulties for speaking, they have an effortful speech due to word searching during the speech, or they have difficulty to pronounce the words, or they have difficulties to understand what the others I say. Are saying. So there, there are another type of dementia that is characterized by the difficulties associated to execute actions. So they lose the, the thread of doing uh, executing a, a motor task. And there is another individual that they just lose the social cognition, the ability to connect with the others. So when a patient arrives with this type of symptoms, and these symptoms, they are more predominant or they are more important than memory loss, we call a typical dementia. And this is what you see in patients with early onset dementia. Now, what about the correlation between depression or how do you differ, especially when it's younger people, how do you differ between depression and dementia or that it could be some other mental health issues? So that's very important because the first uh, 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 a tentative of diagnosis in these individuals are related to psychiatric conditions because it's much more frequent to find in young individuals uh, the, uh, the exa uh, exacerbation of previous psychiatric conditions or exacerbation of a previous neurodevelopmental conditions or even early onset uh, 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 psychiatric uh, 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 manifestations. So uh, it's a very important, very frequently patients with early onset dementia, they come to the office uh, with a kind of a diagnostic, uh, a psychiatric diagnostic that was not clearly uh, stated. Mm -hmm. And in your practice, because you specialize in early onset dementia, can you give us an idea, like how old are the patients that come to you? Like what would be some of the younger ones and what's the average age that you're seeing for early onset? Sometimes uh, they can come even in uh, uh, late 30s. So it's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. So these individuals, they arrive in the office. Uh, some of them are uh, with a significant functional uh, impairment. So they are not able to work anymore. They are in leave of absence. So there are, uh, they cannot uh, conduct their tasks at home anymore. So it depends on the type of uh, disease that is causing dementia. 
Okay. And what what causes it? I mean, in a younger person, you know, I mean, we've we've heard before that there's a correlation perhaps between concussions, like somebody who's done a lot of sports. But, you know, when you're hearing people who are in their, for instance, their late 40s or 50s, I mean, what, what causes that? Yes, there are several uh, different causes of dementia. And it's extremely important to state because dementia is the result of a disease. It's the final process, clinical process found in, found in neurodegenerative conditions. This can be due to uh, the aggregation of proteins, as I explained before. Proteins, they don't work anymore. Or this can be associated with environmental factors. For example, what happens with the sports people with uh, 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 frequent concussions in the brain. So that it's very important as the first step when assessing these patients is to try to establish a diagnosis. And this is extremely important because there are several reasons for that. Uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease is something that is more and more identified as a cause of early onset dementia. And, and this is extremely important to make the diagnosis and to identify the Alzheimer's disease processes in the brain because there, are, there will be impact on the way the patients are managed from the clinical perspective and also in terms of the diagnosis because a number of these causes of early onset dementia, they are associated with a familial disease. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to come back again to some of the signs and symptoms that you already mentioned, because, I mean, the biggest challenge with dementia already is that people don't recognize the signs and symptoms in general, you know, but, you know, especially when it comes to somebody who's younger, you know, what would be very important triggers that people would absolutely should be seen by a neurologist or a doctor? Because like, is there a combination of symptoms that you, that, would appear together and we say, you know, this is really cause for concern? Yes. So this is a very important question, especially because the way these diseases, they progress in the brain is not very fast. It's not something like stroke that one day, from one day to the other, you have the rise of, of, of symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. So they, the disease manifests slowly. And these individuals, they will have a problems associated with specific cognitive domains. And uh, I think uh, it's very important to, uh, to raise awareness about these uh, symptoms, especially among our colleagues, because uh, to, to redirect these patients, for example, from the psychiatry to the neurologist, where the diagnosis, uh, diagnosis can be uh, uh, easily and readily made. So I think I think it's important to understand that, uh, that uh, when the person presents uh, alterations associated with ability to express verbally or ability to conduct the, uh, uh, the professional activities, these individuals, they think, I think they have to be uh, properly assessed. And, uh, and uh, especially in the context of uh, a very clear functional decline. So for, for instance, like significant changes in personality, moods, you know, we hear often about these former athletes, you know, football players or hockey players who, you know, who suddenly start, you know, committing aggressive crimes or, you know, we hear about, you know, the, the impact of concussions. So would it, would significant changes in, in, in personality and behavior be a cause for concern? Absolutely. And I think this is already a very late stage of the problem, right? So if somebody has a clinical history of uh, frequent uh, brain uh, head concussions, and uh, in, especially in, in, if in the professional uh, athlete, I think this is something that is, is, is very clear that this person needs to be assessed. But what's very important is the way, is the very beginning of the disease when the patient is not necessarily fully uh, functionally, functionally affected. I think it's important actually to listen to the patients and try to identify these uh, 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 symptoms. It's very different from typical dementia where we have to target memory and memory is the problem. So here we have a constellation of symptoms that can be either on the execution of, on the side of execution of movements or perhaps planning 
or perhaps the way they react, or perhaps uh, uh, the way they understand the visual world, or the way they express themselves verbally. So it's extremely important uh, to properly assess these individuals, and, and usually they do not present a very clear-cut psychiatric condition. They are patients that they have symptoms, but there is always a kind of a haze of uncertainty around these cases. So I think the important advice here is to do not lose the opportunity to assess these individuals whenever there is something that does not necessarily fit the, uh, the, 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 a clear-cut psychiatric uh, case. So let's talk about some of the challenges that a person being diagnosed with early onset dementia faces as compared to an older person, because it must have a significant impact on their careers, on their family. Um, let's talk about what are some of the challenges. So there are several uh, challenges. I think the first one, as we discussed here, is the diagnosis, right? So I think the uh, the diagnosis has to be properly conducted uh, by a memory uh, specialist. So the diagnosis has several steps. Number one, you know, is is is, is we have to do a, uh, tests in order to identify pathophysiological mechanisms in the brain. So these individuals, they have to go to PET scans, they have to go to MRI scans, they have to undergo sometimes even to lumbar punctures in order to state the diagnosis. And this is something that uh, is a process that sometimes takes a bit of time. So, but once the diagnosis is made, this is a very, very important moment because we understand whether the family needs to be investigated, whether uh, and what will be the prognosis of this individual. So, and whether there is any kind of medication that we can provide to individuals in order to relieve the symptoms. Unfortunately, we don't have any medication that can cure at this point, but it's extremely important to reach to the point where uh, the, the clinical aspect is somehow uh, clear. So the second important aspect that you just mentioned is the post-diagnostic care. So this is a very complicated uh, moment because these individuals, they are not the vast majority of, Alzheimer, of uh, dementia cases. They are about three to 5% of the population. So there is a kind of a lack of specialized services to provide social support to these individuals, the medical support for these individuals, and, uh, and, and, and also uh, to even uh, uh, medical support for these individuals. I think uh, they require special attention. They, there are several services that uh, it's very complex to find to them. For example, uh, these individuals, they have um, motor challenges and they have even difficulties to communicate. So there is a complete lack of specialized services uh, 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 devoted to this type of population. So uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a, man a social management, I just would like to highlight that most of the services for dementia, they are devoted for 65 plus, and these individuals, they clearly have a different uh, care, a landscape, as compared to individuals with uh, young, uh, young, uh, young onset dementia. I can just imagine, you know, should it get to a point where an individual is no longer able to live at home, and they need to transition into, you know, a long-term care facility. The majority of people who are in these facilities are over the age of 80. And so it must be, and I know because I've worked with families who have early onset dementia, it's challenging to make the decision to place somebody who could be in their 60s or even in their late 50s into uh, a residence. So yeah, and, I'm, and this point is extremely important because there is a notion that these individuals, they will rapidly progress, but this is not true. Sometimes mm -hmm. these individuals, they start with dementia uh, at a very young age, and these individuals, they, they, they live for 20 years. So uh, it's, very, uh, it's very important you know, to have a, a, a support for the uh, long-term uh, care of these individuals. Okay, so that's an important myth that you just spoke about because um, a lot of people have that question of, is it true that if somebody becomes diagnosed with dementia at a younger age, it progresses much 
quicker. So it's not true then. So is it, so is it, is, does it progress much more slowly when they're diagnosed at a younger age or, or how does that work? No, I think we have uh, uh, the, the clinical progression of these individuals. They're, they are not, uh, they, they, they can be very different from one to the other, depends on how aggressive the disease or depending on the factors that are somehow affecting the nature of, uh, of the patients. And there is also genetic factors that influence uh, the, uh, the, the susceptibility uh, uh, for a, a fast progression of the disease. So this is a multifactorial, but it's very important to understand that it's not a rule. It's just because an individual started dementia at a very young age, it doesn't mean that the progression of the disease will be fast. So now some important questions. So what advice, two questions, what advice would you give to a person who was just diagnosed with early onset dementia? I mean, how could they take the best care possible of themselves? And the second one is what would you recommend to family members on how to best care for that person? I think the most important aspect is the diagnosis. So dementia is a, is a syndrome, right? So it's a constellation of signs and symptoms. I think my most important advice is to know what is causing dementia. So what is the pathological processes, process that is causing that? And, 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 and this is extremely important because again, it has implications to the family and has implications to uh, 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 the patients and uh, lives. And I think it's very important also to give a chance uh, to themselves. There are a number of uh, emerging therapies. I think it's important to engage in, in, in experimental therapy. These experimental therapy are, are somehow extremely effective, especially for the genetic cases. So there is lots of hope uh, out there uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, regarding the success of these therapies. So I think uh, it's important to be attentive. And this is a message also to the families. So uh, it's important, number one, to understand the diagnosis. Number two, to identify whether uh, the family is at risk. And the third thing is to uh, open uh, the possibilities of uh, uh, experimental uh, therapies. Are you and your team doing any experimental therapies uh, at McGill? Yes. So especially on uh, early onset dementia, we have a special program called uh, DIAN. So this is a program uh, and the, uh, that uh, uh, focuses on the individuals who are carrier of the mutations causative of Alzheimer's disease. So these individuals, they have mutations in about three genes. So it's called PS1, PS2, and APP. Uh, 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 genes and this uh, uh, and 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 we follow these individuals and offer them specialized therapies and specialized interventions. So uh, we are working with another uh, um, big network. Uh, it's called Leads, and uh, and Leads is not for interventions, but Leads is for the characterization of these individuals. What this is led by Liana Apostolova in the US. And the idea is to characterize these populations and to try to understand how young onset dementia differ from late onset dementia. Well, we will make sure to have all of that information on the resources page of the McGill Dementia Education Program website. So for people who would like to have some more information, um, we'll have that available so that they can contact uh, your team uh, Dr. Rosanetta, very important. So and the, any final words, any pieces of advice uh, before we end the webcast today? I think I'd like to leave a message of hope. Usually I think, uh, uh, you know, the topic of dementia involves complex uh, diagnosis, involves uh, a, a significant amount of uh, confusions in the family. But uh, I think we're working very hard in order to find a cure for that. So during the last few years, there was a significant development in terms of the science. We need to understand how this disease works. We need to understand why, this, why these processes of misfolding and aggregation of proteins, they, leave, they lead to neurodegenerative conditions. And I think 
we are very close from that. So uh, we are able today to remove these bad proteins from the brain, uh, specifically in the case of Alzheimer's disease. And we plan actually, we are going to see whether this will bring some uh, rectification for the cognitive and functional uh, uh, difficulties uh, uh, and symptoms associated uh, with this disease. So uh, the message is of hope, and hopefully we have pretty soon a therapy for you. And my, I'm a, such a big advocate for education. So my, my message is to all the families and people listening out there is to become as educated as possible as you can on the illness, you know, understand what's coming next. And also very much to seek out support services for yourself, for your loved one. There are some good resources in Montreal. Once again, we have those resources available on our website under dementia at mcgill.ca um, and uh, under the resource section. But, you know, just continue to live the best life that you can, you know, uh, em embrace life because there, there, is, there is hope. Thank you very much for being on McGill Cares with us today. Thank you so much for the incredible opportunity and congratulations for your wonderful work. Uh, thank you. So this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. If you would like to join our mailing list and stay connected with us so that you know about all the upcoming educational events and future webcasts, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. We will now be taking a break until the fall, until September, and McGill Cares will be returning on a regular basis. So I'm wishing everybody a very good, happy, safe, and healthy summer. Thank you for tuning in.